Good afternoon and thank you, John. I'm unfortunately, for reasons outside my control, I cannot be in Athens today. Uh, still, uh, I'm sure that we will promote a lively discussion with uh, my colleagues and friends, Yanis and Konstantinos. With the, with the advantage of insight, it's now easy to see that uh, the work of central banks to boost growth and resilience, the topic of our session uh, after COVID, was straightforward. Backed by coordinated monetary and fiscal policies, unprecedented support measures, loan moratoria, state guarantees, the purchase emergency uh, program of the ECB, and also supervision and regulatory adjustments during COVID, banks remain well capitalized, held ample liquidity, and were able to play their key role as lenders. The European banking sector proved uh, in this way its resilience during the pandemic and as such financial stability was uh, preserved. Unfortunately, we were not yet out of the pandemic um, facing challenges uh, to level out supply and demand across sectors and regions and a second exogenous shock hit the economy, the cruel and unjustified invasion of Ukraine by Russia. It is difficult to disentangle the impact of these various shocks. So, uh, in my opinion, we should remain humble uh, at the moment of taking conclusions uh, on what went wrong, if anything uh, at all uh, went wrong. But the fact is that in an environment of high demand and short supply because of extended COVID lockdowns, particularly in China, global supply chain disruptions exacerbated. As a result, energy, industrial and food prices increased steering inflation up. It is a fact that monetary policy, as Yanis already mentioned, has a limited effect in counteracting increases in prices driven by supply shocks. Going after supply-driven inflation is um, eventually even uh, detrimental to growth with the potential to destabilize inflation expectations. However, inflation pressures broaden spread across sectors recommending policy action. And so monetary policy uh, uh, has to act. And we will act, again, as Yanis already mentioned, gradually and flexibly. We will use all instruments in our toolkit, uh, and we are actually expanding uh, our toolkit, toolkit to guarantee price stability in a context of financial stability and, and this is very important, a proper functioning of the transmission mechanisms across the euro area. This approach to normalization of our monetary stance is ideal also to promote a successful return to what I call the spring 2020 spirit. What is the spring 2020 spirit? Is one uh, of coordination and exploring of positive synergies between different economic policies in Europe. Because not only the role of fiscal policy is fundamental, but also because fighting a crisis of confidence and geopolitical tensions requires governments, firms and households to be aligned as how to spread the costs of the crisis over time. Monetary policy cannot do it alone and concerns of fiscal or financial dominance should not resurface again in Europe. A cycle of interest rates increases is desirable, but brings about risks that should be mitigated. Let me mention some of them. The higher burden for borrowers leads to an increase of the credit risk, especially for more vulnerable corporates. The banking sector should have these incorporated in their business models and margins for default. The lessons of the past are well learned by all and we are seeing a desirable degree of caution in the banking sector. Furthermore, in the short run, the increase in interest rates will improve banks' net interest income. In the medium term, a greater accumulation of operational net interest income can more than offset the negative impacts of market risk and of impairments for credit risk, 
Overall, I believe that better prospects for the banking sector can be the result of this. However, however, the medium term brings other challenges to the banking sector. I'm not going to be very detailed uh, on them, but let me mention two of them, cybersecurity and climate transition. Cyber risks are well are very well known, so let me spend a few seconds on, on the climate transition. This is a structural break, and this is not related with COVID, with the war. This was something that we were facing already for quite some time. We have indeed been adjusting to it, and we need to continue this effort. From the banking sector perspective, it requires a proper incorporation of the legacy exposures to climate risk in banks' balance sheets, as well as an accurate assessment of the new exposures. On the social dimension, the green transition is an excellent opportunity for the banking sector supported during the financial crisis uh, by public funds to give back to the community. Indeed, as there are no pure market-based solutions on this matter, the climate transition is a social responsibility issue that needs to be integrated in the traditional resource allocation functions of banks. Again, coordination is of the essence. Signals from all dimensions of economic policy should be clear and predictable so that economic agents can adjust. Well, this is probably the message that I'd like to, to, to start with today. Uh, we need really to get uh, into uh, the spirit of coordination. Thank you, Joan, and uh, happy to uh, debate uh, further.